Welcome to the TaxCast from the Tax Justice Network. Around 20 minutes each month of news, scandal and analysis you won't find anywhere else. With me, Naomi Fowler. The TaxCast is available to everyone on www.tackletaxhavens.com. It's also on the Tax Justice Network's website, www.taxjustice.net forward slash TaxCast. You can subscribe to our RSS feed, to the Tax Justice Network's YouTube channel, email me on naomi at taxjustice.net, look for us on iTunes, or find us on a radio station near you. Coming up in the TaxCast, women and tax justice. It's only half the population of the world after all. But first, the Tax Justice News Roundup. So it's out. Russell Brand and Michael Winterbottom's latest film, The Emperor's New Clothes, hit the screens this month. Tax justice is a central theme in this angry film that looks at the effects of decades of failed neoliberal policies on real people and real lives, and some solutions. Here's Michael Winterbottom. Well, obviously you want to change the world. I just kind of hope that people watch it. You know, people watch it that they feel angry about what's been going on. 2008, everyone knew the financial crisis was the fault of unregulated free markets. And yet two years later, we were persuaded that the cure for that was, you know, to cut public spending, to have 80 billion in cuts. I hope when people watch it, they think, yeah, I recognise that. I'm really angry about that. And why why did I forget to be angry about that recently? The general message of the film is you can change things, but in order to change things, you have to get involved and get active. And look out for the full TaxCast interview with Michael Winterbottom on the Tax Justice Network blog. Have a look for the film in cinemas near you, and if you're in the UK, you can make a screening happen. Just go to www.ourscreen.com to find out how. In other news, HSBC Bank says it's considering moving its headquarters from London. Apparently they're annoyed at a bank levy that cost them £750 million last year. Well, the New Economics Foundation totted up an effective subsidy they enjoyed in the form of cost savings of over £4 billion a year. (laughs) So goodbye and shut the door on your way out. A former head of the IMF has been arrested on tax evasion charges in Spain. Rodrigo Rato is also accused of mismanaging money at Bankia, the bank he used to run but had to be rescued by the Spanish government a few years back. Why is the European Investment Bank still using tax havens? That's a question asked by a new report just out. The EU's public financial institution led the way in making promises on tax haven use, but it still runs public money through havens. And we know what that means. Lack of transparency, less accountability and easier to corrupt. The CEO of the company in Seattle decided to tackle inequality direct. He's cut his own salary by 90% to pay every worker at least $70,000 a year. In the US, CEOs earn nearly 300 times the salary of an average worker. And finally, whistleblower Stephanie Gibold is on her way to testify in Argentina on how UBS and other Swiss banks moved their tax evasion experts to Latin America and other emerging economies a few years back. It seems they saw them as less burdened with pesky regulation and talk of transparency initiatives. That's the news roundup for this month. Now we're going to talk to John Christensen of the Tax Justice Network for his take on this month. OK, John, let's start with General Electric, which is one of the biggest US companies, also happens to be one of the biggest US tax avoiding companies. And um, they have uh, made an announcement, it's quite interesting, they've decided to sell off its bank, GE Capital, and all its other non-core businesses, and it seems to be trying to get out of the financial nonsense it got itself mixed up with and uh, return to a kind of a manufacturing base. And in the process of doing that, they're going to be repatriating 10 to 15 billion dollars in assets from offshore back into the US. That means they're going to be paying four to six billion dollars in taxes. So uh, I suppose, first of all, the thing to say about that, the the, the sky didn't fall in. And uh, after this announcement, their shares actually went up by eight percent. So quite an interesting development. What does it tell us? Yes, um, General Electric used to make huge profits from its financing activities from from GE Capital. But after the crisis, that bank is now deemed as being too big to fail, which means it faces a completely different regulatory environment 
and that regulatory environment will make it less profitable. So they've decided that they're going to divest themselves away from their banking business. They've announced plans to get rid of GE Capital, and they're also selling about $26 billion of real estate assets. A lot of money, and they're going to go back to their core business, which involves things like making jet engines and oil drilling platforms and things like that. Real tangible stuff which creates jobs. Now, the US tax codes since the 1960s have allowed American companies to hold their profits offshore um, without incurring any tax liability till they bring the, the, the profits into the United States. Two years ago, GE was holding some 108 billion US dollars offshore uninvested in the US economy, which is absurd. Now, just to make the situation even more absurd, the US Treasury is so short of tax dollars um, because of decades of corporate tax avoidance, amongst other things, that they need to borrow from wherever they can, um, including big corporations who need to invest all of that cash which they're holding offshore because the Treasury needs the money to overcome the deficit they've been incurring because of tax avoidance. Which means that US taxpayers are having to pay interest now to service Treasury bonds, which have been bought by US companies <laughs> which don't pay tax. I mean, the, the whole thing is a kind of madness. And if that situation isn't already crazy enough, it gets worse because US companies in the last few years have been using all this offshore cash not to invest in creating new jobs and developing new technology in America, but to buy foreign companies through places like Ireland and turn those foreign companies into the legal parents of the entire US group, which allows even more tax avoidance than before. So we have one craziness built on the other. Now, what typically happens is that big American corporations lobby heavily between election periods and push for typically the Republican candidate to offer a tax amnesty so they can repatriate the cash they're holding offshore at a much lower tax rate. And that typically they, they promise that if they can repatriate that cash, that will be invested in creating American jobs. But what happened a decade ago is that uh, George Bush gave precisely that tax amnesty because of all the promises being made about job creation, lots of billions flowed back into the US economy, but unfortunately it didn't flow back into any new investments or any job creation. It flowed back into the pockets of the shareholders. So we, we, we now have evidence that tax amnesties simply do not work as a means of attracting new investment in job creation. So General Electric needs this cash to reorganise its restructuring, and the, the really interesting thing about the announcement earlier this month was that the share prices actually rose by 8%, mm. which suggests to me that investors are recognising that General Electric needs to concentrate more on its core activities and pay much less attention to the financial engineering it used to do and to the structuring itself around tax avoidance structures because that's taken them away from where they need to be, which is their core job creating productive activity. This will inject much needed tax dollars into the US government's coffers. So it's a good news story. Good, we like good news stories on the tax cast. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it, it seems to be a good idea to get out of finance these days. Well, I think that companies like GE, who used to make a lot of money out of um, the deregulated finance, will find that it's very hard indeed to make genuinely profitable investment into the boring, plain vanilla type of banking activity that we do need to go back to if the US economy and the European economy is to have a new and more productive base. So we need to get away from the, the exciting investment, i.e. speculative activity. We need to close down on the, the too big to fail and the too big to jail banking activity. So I think we are well rid of GE Capital. GE is well rid of GE Capital, and the American people are well rid of GE Capital. Hurrah. <laughs> right. Let's go to the UK now. Uh, we at TJN knew perfectly well that when the Prime Minister David Cameron was chairing the G8 summit and making all kinds of promises about how he was tackling tax avoidance and secrecy and anonymity, we knew that it smelt a bit funny. And um, 
We have a letter that's been revealed from uh, a former lobbyist for the Cayman Islands who also happens to be a, a peer in the House of Lords in the British Parliament. Um, Lord Blencathra wrote a letter to the Cayman Islands and it's really a fascinating read because it's kind of an insider's take on what the UK Prime Minister was actually up to when he was making all these proclamations. <laughs> um, and uh, I'm just going to quote a very revealing few sentences because basically what he's saying is that the context was at the time Germans and other countries were pushing hard for a financial transactions tax. The French were pushing for blacklists of jurisdictions with tax regimes lower than theirs were. Anyway, I'm quoting here. The UK government knew from long experience that it cannot chair a G8 summit nor negotiate in the European Union by simply saying no to what other member states are pushing. It has to present either a genuine alternative or a false initiative which will divert other member states from pursuing their agenda, close quote. So he's actually basically writing this letter, which uh, I'm sure he didn't actually intend to be made public, <laughs> to say, don't worry, the Prime Minister of Britain doesn't actually mean it. Oh, you know, this is, you couldn't um, actually uh, find a more embarrassing story. The back story here is that in 2013, UK Prime Minister David Cameron and his government were frankly deeply unpopular in Britain. Their austerity policies um, had failed uh, and they were seen as simply serving the political interests of the 1%. So hidden away from the British public, the UK government and David Cameron and uh, people like Boris Johnson, the mayor of London, were busy lobbying hard on behalf of the city of London to block attempts by the European Union to implement a European financial transaction tax. Even set at a very low rate, as low as 0.01% on derivatives trade, that would have been an effective curb on the kind of high volume, low margin trading that London specialises in. So city lobbies were really anxious to distract attention away from the European financial transaction tax. And this, according to uh, this letter, explains why Mr Cameron decided in 2013 to focus attention on tax evasion and tax havens, with a particular focus on Britain's overseas territories and crown dependencies. The PM knew that such a move would be very popular indeed with the British electorate because everyone is really, really angry about the scale of tax dodging. But what has allegedly emerged is that Cameron was using the tax havens quite simply as a distraction and actually had no real intention of doing anything much at all. Now, this accusation doesn't come from an opposition politician or from someone with a different agenda. This allegation comes from Lord Blencathra, otherwise known as David Maclean, previously a minister under Margaret Thatcher's government, and he wrote to the Cayman Island government to advise them that Cameron's public statement about cracking down on tax havens was quite simply political posturing. An attempt, and I quote, to distract G8 and the European Union from the financial transaction tax. That's what he said. Lord Blencrathra was until last year retained by the Cayman Islands government on a princely fee of £12,000 a month to lobby on Cayman's behalf in the British Parliament. Uh, and I should mention that once he, his uh, position as a lobbyist for the Cayman Islands was exposed by the Bureau of Investigative Journalists, there was an inquiry and he was um, found to have breached the parliamentary code of conduct. So there he had to kiss goodbye to his £12,000 a month. Which must have hurt him hurt him and his pockets very deeply. Indeed, indeed. Now, talking of tax havens and uh, the British overseas territories and crown dependencies, there has been a bit of movement, I think. There's been some talk, but the talk is cheap. But there's some talk that the Gibraltar government might be breaking ranks from the position of the other overseas territories and introducing a public registry of beneficial ownership. Watch this space. That will be interesting because the usual position of those tax havens is screw you and uh, uh, we'll, we'll do it when everyone else does, which is kind of the Swiss default position. The default position. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, John. John Christensen of the Tax Justice Network. Now it's time for the TaxCast special feature. 
Most people agree it's in everyone's interests for taxation to be used as a tool to address inequality. So how about women and tax justice? Half the world's population tends to work for less money than the other half, and very often they work for no money at all. Their countries owe them a huge amount, yet they benefit less from welfare and state support, and they often pay more in unfair taxes. This month, The TaxCast looks at tax justice and women. Men and women are differently situated in the economy in all sorts of ways. Tax has such important implications for women. This is feminist economist Professor Susan Himmelwaite of the Women's Budget Group. The main thing that really matters to women is that tax is raised, that a reasonable revenue is collected by the government because it can be spent in ways that are really useful to women. Right, and when you look at some of the choices in this austerity age that we're in, uh, the first things to go are the support for caring roles and things like this. Many wealthier countries have been busy cutting back some of the gains that were made for women, and that's hitting them very hard, isn't it? That's right. I mean, in practice, that's what's happened. So all sorts of methods of cutting tax tend to be not very beneficial to women. So current austerity moves that we've had, which have focused a lot on cuts in social spending, have hit women very badly, as I think by now is quite well known. And that is because a lot of the spending that governments do are things that enable women to participate in the economy. And if they are cut... Women end up possibly losing their jobs, since more of them work in the state sector. And they are greater users of social services, either for themselves or for their families. And finally, they are the ones who tend to do the unpaid work that ends up compensating for the lack of public services. But very often, women women are the ones within particular families, particular households, who make the decisions as to what to do with their lives, which don't end up being very beneficial to them in the long run, financially at any rate. I mean, they may may get a lot of other good things from it. And women tend to be... talking about child... uh, Particularly about care. Perhaps giving up a career or maybe not intending to, but uh, that can be what happens. Or not even giving it up, but reducing the amount of time put into it. Women, on the whole, are much, particularly in old age, are much poorer than men. And that's largely to do with the fact that they've been caring when they're younger. And while we have better policies in place now than, you know, the women who are now retired, who are on very low incomes, will have been subject to when they were younger, they're not going to result in equality. You know, we need a much more radical shake-up of what's going on. One of the main markers in life where equality slides in a downward direction particularly fast is if women decide to have children. One father in Texas sat down one day and did the sums on what his stay-at-home wife's work is actually worth in dollars and cents. He wrote a blog on it that went viral. This is Stephen Nelms. My wife has been working since she was like 14 years old, so that paycheck has always been very important to her. And When we had our son Ezra, we just weren't able to both continue working, so we decided that she would stay home. And that was a big sacrifice for her. And so I just thought, well, I need to try to figure out what her paycheck should be. Okay, and tell me uh, about the calculations that you made, because you went into a lot of detail. Yeah, so um, I just tallied up what she does for us on a you know daily basis and took into account the 8 to 5 child care, the cleaning up of the apartment, She does all of our finances. She's our finance guru. So I took that into account and just started doing some research online and trying to find different businesses or services that offer these sorts of things, you know, like a maid service or a chef or a cook or whatever it is, and tried to take some pretty conservative estimate of what she does for us and what it would cost me to (laughs) enlist someone, a hireable service for that, and just tallied up an annual salary for her. Right, so you itemised childcare, cooking, cleaning, shopping, household finance, management, and you came to quite an interesting conclusion. So what was that? Uh, That she is way, way out of my pay range. From what I had drawn up, her annual salary should be around 74,000 US dollars. And that is 
far beyond what I personally make as my annual salary. So she is far outside of my ability to afford what she does for us. I feel like I have always appreciated her hard work. I think it, it provides that perspective that when I get my paycheck and it's my name on that paycheck, that doesn't mean that I have sole rights to that income. So I think it's provided a very uh, real, practical balance to how we understand our finances to be a partnership and that we both have equal claim to that monthly or biweekly income. It kind of puts a different spin on what women, and it's usually women, that tend to stay in the home and look after children, uh, how that might be recognised in the tax system when you think that very often they've left work, they get behind in their skills and uh, they tend to earn less when they go back to work and then they have smaller pensions. And, you know, there's a lot of financial implications to actually making this choice, aren't there? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I, mean, I think it's very interesting that in the U.S., our federal government will give us a tax credit for having a kid, but not a tax credit for a parent staying home to care for that child. But there's a lot of talk of how we appreciate those spouses who would stay at home to care for the family, but it's not really supported by how our tax system actually would reward that kind of work. Stephen Nelms, Ezra's dad. Of course, the kind of care Stephen's wife does that he so appreciates is priceless. The point is, though, that very often it's carers, usually women, who are disadvantaged when childcare comes up. And the state really doesn't do much to help them. Childcare costs are so high, choices are often made for them. Susan Himmelweight. What we have are economies that have benefited from women's increased employment. Undoubtedly, you know, nearly all European economies have benefited from larger numbers of women going into work, paying taxes and contributing, you know, to the European social model, if you like. But the system requires somebody else to pick up what these women were doing at home. And governments have been very reluctant to do that. So we've had a sort of hodgepodge of different ways of, of coping. It's never been properly funded. And... I think because women contribute possibly more to society in the course of their everyday roles, it will benefit women particularly because they're, particularly through through caring roles, they're doing more that is not directly for reward. It seems to me that that is quite a good argument for having care services that are publicly provided and publicly funded. And governments can make very different choices if they're really serious about equality. In Sweden, affordable childcare is an official policy. Parents spend no more than 1% to 3% of the family's income on childcare, depending on the number of children. Compare that with the United Kingdom, where childcare costs are the highest in the European Union and families pay, on average, 26.6% of their income for it. It's up to women and their families, of course, about how they want to care for their children, but they must have real choices. But in this austerity age, all kinds of social services are being reduced or are disappearing. And to add insult to injury, that's usually accompanied by tax giveaways of all kinds. In the Global South... You can also see the same process in action. The idea that incentivising, or in effect subsidising companies, is the way to go. And that's very often at the expense of women. We do support strongly that there should be public services accessible, affordable, because that's what can make a difference in women's lives. But the the excuse is always, the rationalisation is always, uh, we don't have the revenues for that. This is May Buenaventura from Jubilee South in the Philippines. Developing countries in Asia are hemorrhaging money. The Philippines lost an estimated $80 billion over a 10-year period, but that could have been avoided if the government had different priorities. Studies have shown that a huge part of those outflows are not really from corruption, although of course there's corruption, and not really from criminal activities, but more from the corporations. And uh, our context is such that there's a whole system of incentives for corporations, for transnational corporations in particular. And uh, this set of incentives 
has been growing and growing. We're giving away incentives so very generously and even incentives where the investments would have been made anyway, such as uh, where there are extractive industries. You also have uh, a lot of uh, political people who are also corporate people. But while uh, ordinary people, when they get their wages, the taxes have already been put away. And then you compare that, that with uh, huge uh, multinationals earning millions, perhaps even billions of dollars, and they can get away with the, all these things, no? And they also have the resources to engage an army of uh, accountants and lawyers to do aggressive tax planning. So uh, th- you can see right away how, how unequal the system is. And it gets worse for women in the Philippines. The Philippine government, like many others in the global south, is a heavy user of VAT, value-added tax, or consumption tax, on everyday purchases for their revenue collection. May Buenaventura. International financial institutions like the IMF has been pushing this because uh, of their argument that it's the easiest way to collect revenues. And we still have a lot of basic goods such as sugar, cooking oil, that ordinary people use, and it is not that exempt that affects women, especially the large numbers of women in the informal economy in conditions of precarious work subjected to attacks as regressive as the VAT. Philippine women are usually poorer than men. They're usually the carers of the family. And as in the global north, state support for care work where it existed is moving from the paid to the unpaid sphere, and it's women who are taking up the slack for care work that's no longer state-subsidised and they just can't afford to pay for. Public spending on health remains below international recommended levels in the Philippines and the maternal mortality rates going up instead of down. So despite strong women's movements in the Philippines, the government focus still doesn't seem to be on improving women's lives. If we can push for a more equitable condition where the higher earning corporations should pay their share, that's already a big boost to building the domestic resources we need. And it's a worry because even if we do get the taxes we need and raise the revenues, we have an automatic appropriations law that says that uh, our debts, the loans that we make from the international financial institutions must be paid before any other public expenditure. So if we have this certain amount of money, Congress will automatically put away what needs to be paid before we allocate for education, for health, for disaster preparedness, community development, and so on and so forth. In the time of the ousted dictator Ferdinand Marcos, we had a very big external debt. And this was the debt pushed on us. And uh, many of those projects we call illegitimate because they did not benefit the people. They were enabled upon the behest of corrupt leaders and they destroyed the environment. Just one example is we have a a project many years before. It's called the Bataan Nuclear Power Plant. And uh, we have never gotten a single watt of electricity from the project and it's already been paid. So if there's money for projects like that one, Huge debts to service from Marcus's time, subsidies for multinational corporations, but there isn't money for raising people out of poverty. And so, understandably, the idea of paying tax doesn't go down too well with ordinary Filipinos. May Buenaventura. We should be able to raise the resources for the future that we want. People, you know... They look at the tax system as corrupt and tax laws as punitive. Very difficult to change attitudes that taxes should actually be a source of our well-being, of our development, of our future. We have to work on owning these systems, changing them, and making them work for our present improvement of our lives and the future that we want. And unfortunately, the idea that tax makes the lives of ordinary people better seems to be losing ground in the global north too, as governments turn their attention to competing with other nations to drop corporate tax rates lower and lower, creating tax wars 
The Tax Justice Network thinks corporate taxes could be abolished completely within a few years. And so we have a situation where tax revenue is way lower than it should be, public service provision is being scaled back, and the tax burden is falling on ordinary people. Susan Himmelwaite again. What was very important is to make a positive case for taxation. That is really important for women, to make a positive case that we shouldn't be talking about tax burdens but tax contributions, and that those people who earn the most or have the most should contribute the most. Tax is not a bad thing, but it's a good thing. It's part of social solidarity and the mark of a civilised society that a fair degree of the wealth of that society is redistributed. We know governments are failing people in poverty, but they're also failing women who are owed so much and yet they're getting so little. It doesn't have to be this way. You've been listening to the TaxCast from the Tax Justice Network. We'll be back next month. (laughs) 